All right, for those of you who end up watching this on YouTube, I apologize. I'm going to take just a minute here to uh, do some quick timing tests. All right, for those of you who end up watching this on YouTube, I apologize. I'm going to take just a minute here to uh, do some quick timing tests. Audio test one. Audio test one. Audio test one. Okay, um, I made a couple of changes to some of my settings between last stream and today's stream in order to try to remove some of the, ch the chat delay. Um, I switched with which server I was streaming through uh, from a New York server to a Virginia server, so we might see a little bit less of a delay between when I say something and when the chat hears it and when I can respond from uh, respond to them. It looks like I've got about a five to six second audio delay between what I say from when I say something to when you hear it and then it looks like we've got a chat delay of like seven or eight seconds uh, so, you know, total that probably adds up to about a 15 second delay-ish. Um, I don't know if that's markedly better or worse than before. Uh, it's going to be something that I'm aware of. I was watching uh, Mark Koenig's stream this morning, um, and he only had a, like, a text delay of like three seconds or, or something like crazy like that. So, I'm probably going to try to switch some more of my settings. Uh, I might try using Streamlabs chat setup rather than Twitch's direct chat setup to see if we can go, go ahead and make some changes uh, and end up with a little bit better stream interaction. Okay, at that moment, you know, <laughs> end Phil testing stream stuff. All right, uh, good evening, my name's Phil Gallagher. Tonight we're going to be streaming with Mono White Death and Taxes. Uh, if you've heard my name around before, it's because I run Thraben University. Uh, it's linked below the stream if you haven't heard of it, and you're a fan of Death and Taxes, you're definitely going to want to check it out. Um, this is not one of my normal stream hours. Uh, William S. donated in order to have me stream with this deck list. Um, it's just very solid, no-nonsense, mono-white DNT. Flex slots are split between Sarah Avenger and Mirren Crusader, and the Cavern of Souls were removed for just two additional planes in order to just have, like, absolute mana stability against decks like Delver. Hey, Moxall! Thank you very much for resubscribing. I, I appreciate your support and, you know, your replies that you give on the, the various forums and whatnot. Praise be to Thalia. Um, sideboard is relatively stock as well. Uh, again, going up to the third path to exile in order to, you know, really stick it to the Delver decks that are super popular right now. And my trademark sort of war and peace here because it's awesome and a lot of fun. Uh, since this is a relatively stock deck list, I don't have a lot to say, and we're just going to jump right into games tonight. I mean, if if the Day 2 metagame is going to be, you know, 25% Grixis Delver and another, you know, 6 or so percent Bug Delver on top of that, it, it makes sense. Yeah, like, we're just not going to lose to Delver with a deck like this unless they have very, very strong draws.
on the list of things completely unrelated to the stream. Did you know they make mochi filled with ice cream? Because I just learned that recently. And that's kind of a game changer. It's delicious. For anyone not familiar with mochi, it's kind of like these, uh, these Japanese gummy treats. They're, they're kind of squishy. I think they're like rice-based. And normally they're filled with, like, delicious goo. But these ones were filled with ice cream. So I just had a bunch of mochi that was filled with green tea ice cream. It was awesome. Yeah, Scudo, I know. I was in shock, too. I just killed the uh, the pack of green tea ones, and starting tomorrow, I'll be going through the uh, the mango flavored ones. Oriental grocery stores are the best. You just explore and end up with all all these random things. Sometimes you get weird things that are a total bust, and other things you other times you end up with like ultimate deliciousness. I can vouch for the green tea one being good. Uh, can't vouch for the chocolate. I'm actually allergic to chocolate. There's a there's a fun fill fact that I don't know if it's come up on the stream before. I uh, know I've played against this player. I think lands. the other instance of their name. This is why I keep my own individual spreadsheet. No, not lands, turbo depths. I'll keep this. It's not the strongest hand against turbo depths, but since I have Mom and Sarah Avenger, I can just wall a Merit Lodge forever with this hand. Oh no, I'm uh, I am all about the uh, the risky Oriental store choices. The uh, squid flavored chips I got those those were a mistake. I couldn't get the roommates to kill those either. That was rough. Um, what else have I gotten recently? And of course, there's like these delicious like little cream filled panda cookie snacks. Like everybody loves these. They're just awesome. Damn, I joined too late to plead for Hikori again. Hey, if, uh, if you really want that Hikori stream, you, you know what you need to do. Otherwise, you can, uh... Ooh, Elder Spirit Guide. Oh shit, double Elvish Spirit Guide. Okay. Uh, we just died of that. We got turned two without the vampire hex mage. Or no, shit, that's, that's, yeah, they're turned two, them on the play. Huh. Yep. That, uh, that does it. Womp womp. Should have played Revoker on turn one. On Elvish Spirit Guide. Bleh. Alright. Uh, so let let the record show that just about any hand on the draw probably doesn't beat that. Like, in order to beat that, we have to have Caracas or Swords to Plowshares. 
any other combination of cards that we have is completely irrelevant against that start. <laughs> well, yeah, if uh, the games are that fast, I'll be uh, super, super sad. Alright, so entire equipment package can go. That's totally irrelevant. Then it gets trickier from there. <laughs> selfless spirit would have been good there. As a note for selfless spirit testing, sure. Um... Uh... Maybe Council's Judgment is clunky. It can get rid of the annoying stuff they can board in, like Pithing Needles, though, and Sylvan Libraries that were in the main deck. Most of my decks just like really good against theirs, though. Maybe prelate's slightly awkward. <sighs> Crusader too dumb of a beater. I could buy that. I could also buy the fact that I might be over sideboarding a little bit. Alright, Hand has multiple Path to Exiles to answer Merit Lodge, a Flicker Whip to answer Merit Lodge, and a Canonist as Disruption. Seems fine. Yeah, Moxel, I also don't love Canonist, uh, but... Cards that slow my opponent down in any capacity are helpful. Canonist also comes down a turn earlier than something like uh, Crusader would. Did my opponent just like YOLO no lands? No, just like playing the second main phase land for no apparent reason. Opponent's hand's probably kind of weak. Since I have double path, I think I'm going to just like play the Canonist as an additional point of power rather than play out the mom and hold up just Caracas because I can't be holding up path. Alright, so there's the Pithing Needle for Caracas. I'm going to give my opponent one more turn worth of clock in order so that the rest of the game I can have, like, Flicker Wisp mom protection available to me. <laughs> Flicker Wisp the needle to make them type it in again. <laughs> the tilt value. Whoop. 
You stay back. Okay, you have a crop rotation. For an herbore. Alright. This tells me that they probably have another Dark Depths in hand. They scoop it up. Not a not a lot going on in that game. Banner Legacy matchup right here. Uh, I can't do anything with my hand other than waste them twice. While that's fine, uh, that's probably not enough to just win this matchup. You know, even if I draw, like, a white source, then I just have Mom, and I have, like, these three drops just absolutely stranded in hand. I'm gonna mulligan. Uh, this hand's great. That's a tricky scry. I think I'm going to bottom that one. I want another land, so once I have Thalia in play, I can still do my thing with uh, the removal spells. I hosted instead of raided. Oh well. Thank you for your host. My chat will fight back with, uh, with Thalia emotes if you do decide you want to raid me some other time. Opponent. What do you have for me? Just a fetch. Vial did not get pithy needled. I am happy. Mo Bogsley, what do you usually stream? I don't know that I've come across your stream before. Or if I have, I just don't recognize your username off the top of my head. Ooh, Traverse. And the Street Wraith goes and gives them the, uh, the Delirium to go and get what they actually want. I raided you Monday? I did? I don't even know how to raid. Oops. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, maybe I, maybe I auto hosted you, or not auto hosted. Maybe, maybe I hosted you Monday night. That might have happened. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I did, I did host you Monday night. That's right. On my list of things I need to learn how to do, I should probably just add rating to that. That way, if I'm ever, uh, you know, around when Julian happens to like stream or something like that, we can get him and attack him with Dahlia emotes. Alright, opponent getting Sylvan Safekeeper with their uh, second Traverse the Uvenwald. Oh, it's just Slash Raid. That, in fact, is super easy. Even someone like me could do that. All right, enjoy your paper magic. All right, you want to thought tease me? Well, the bad news is I drew another source to plowshares. <coughs> Although my flicker wisp is probably just going here. We try to get rid of the Sylvan Safekeeper. It's gonna get Shroud. It's fine. Like, that's a, uh, you know, two mana destroy target land. I accept this. Hey, Drunk Gaming, welcome to the stream. That's a Vampire Hex Mage. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that's a Merit Lodge, alright. Did my opponent just throw this game away? I just get to, like, put in my Flicker Wisp, block the Safekeeper, Swords the Merit Lodge token because of the line they just took. Wow. Wow. I don't know. I don't know.
No, the, the token was pro-white at the time. If their last card was out of this world, they still would have had to pay one for Thalia. So, we got them. Uh, it's going to take a little while to kill him, uh, but it's going to be hard to recover from that. So for anyone why I love Legacy, it's because little tiny decisions, like attacking for one extra point of damage, make the difference between wins and losses of entire matches. <laughs> Sorry, opponent is making funny uh, PUBG noises. You have to have, like, an Elvish Spirit Guide if you want to do anything right now. You want a crop rotation? Sure, you can crop rotation. No other things for you this turn, though. No Vampire Hex Major Borg for you. Yeah, the, the opponent's deck focuses so much on Delirium at the cost of, like, doing things that their deck should actually be doing. It's, uh, an odd choice. Alright, so my opponent took that game from absolutely unlosable to basically auto-loss because of a bad attack for one point of damage with a Sylvan Safekeeper. I love Legacy. Boy, do I love Legacy. Night Agate, thanks for staying in for that one round. Good luck with your big meeting tomorrow.
this hand looks awesome. Uh, I'm going to keep this opponent last seen on Grixis Delver. Jam Mythalia, the upside of it resolving is really, really high. What's your favorite card? Vampire Nighthawk is my favorite magic card. Two black and a colorless, two, three, flying, lifelink, death touch. What more could you want out of a card as a new player? My description was quite melodic. Vampire Nighthawk was the first magic card that I ever bought. Uh, I, I bought like a... I think it was like a Dark Steel starter deck, and then bought like four Vampire Nighthawks for it, and I felt, like, absolutely unbeatable. Card was everything I ever wanted in a magic card. <coughs> We're gonna try to just, like, stick it to my opponent real hard here. We're gonna revoke Deathrite Shaman. Wasteland the red source, port their trap. Give them the metaphorical middle finger. And still have a sweet, sweet Aether Vial curve. Yeah, you ain't doing anything with that mana. Mm-mm, not with Thalia in play. <laughs> Alright, yeah, you can get my four. We'll, uh, we'll just leave that either while there at two. Welcome to Legacy, ladies and gentlemen. Fair and interactive format. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're getting them pretty good. Although, uh. Daddy Windex there, let's, uh, w we can choose better words than rape. I try to, to keep this uh, a relatively family-friendly stream since, you know, my focus is on education here.
My opponent says dumb to the attack. Yeah, you didn't see the uh, the auto held message that he sent afterwards. We don't we don't need shit like that in this channel. Opponent, uh, doing all sorts of nifty things there. Their death rate shaman's still revoked. We're gonna get a piece of equipment with the stone forge. We're gonna source to plowshares one of their threats, flicker wisp out that elemental token in all likelihood. Um... This is probably just a game that Jitte can take over. Uh, if the Stoneforge gets removed, I'd like to just have another uh, thing that I can cast with one more land, rather than something that gets stuck in my hand. Uh, let me get to that question in just a second after I play my turn. I'm just going to get aggressive here so that I can get frisky with my Revoker. Alright, Scudo. Take care. Talk to you again soon. Alright, that longer comment now. Uh, I've wanted to play d for a long time. Have you had success at paper events? Yes, a considerable amount. 
Never played Legacy, but I imagine a uh, Eldrazi and Burn are popular since they're cheap. Uh, yes, both decks are relatively popular. Uh, Burn is a great budget entry point to the format. And Eldrazi is something that a lot of modern players cross over into relatively easily due to already having most of the creatures from either when they were in Standard or from, like, playing a modern deck that has them in it, like Eldrazi Tron or, like, Bant Eldrazi. Burn's an even-ish matchup for regular death and taxes. Eldrazi is maybe even to slightly unfavorable for regular death and taxes. Alright, opponent showed us Lightning Bolt off of the uh, Delver Flip, so we're not going to go for an Equip this turn. Will I pay one for days? Yes, I will. I tapped both of my lands to make it look like I uh, was paying for Thalia mana and didn't actually have mana. That's great. I'm so glad that actually worked. Alright, one of these things gets bolted here. Take your choice. It's probably Bolt Revoker to turn back on Deathrite Shaman. Well, just Bolt Avenger to live longer. Yeah, I do some cute things sometimes. Uh, really glad that my opponent played the uh, Underground Sea there, just to confirm that they were like an actual Grixis Delver deck. Like I know they looked like Grixis Delver, but there was like some small possibility that they were a rug deck. Okay, um, now I have to figure out what I want to put this Jitte on. The Flicker Wisp on its own is potentially lethal. If my opponent has a Lightning Bolt, they can Lightning Bolt the Crusader. If they have a Fatal Push, they can't Fatal Push the Crusader. They've already used a Lightning Bolt. Kinda just want to dump it on Crusader. Like, it's, a high, it's the highest upside play if it works. Then I attack in with all my creatures. If they have Bolt, it has to go here. My opponent takes three, blocks this, then has to trade Revoker for Delver. Oh yeah, they don't have push mana. Alright, so we're just playing around Bolt. Alright, show me Bolt or die. Effectively. We'll attack with that. Oh, I guess Deathrite's off, so that's just lethal now. It's kind of disappointing. Yeah, opponent should have... Uh... Yeah, I, I guess there's not much they can do.
All right, so we're playing D&T versus Grixis Delver. We're on the play and we win versus D Sile Coves. Game one win with aggressive vile hand. All right, turning to the sideboard. A whopping three paths to exile. Two council's judgment. We'll consider to rest in peace. Revoker comes out. Prelate comes out. Probably means I'll leave the rest in pieces in the sideboard and trim Athalia. In the past, I've been going and removing recruiters to play the rest in piece, but now that Grixis Delver is going and playing more of a mid range game for the post sideboard games, I don't really think that's right anymore. It may even be better to like just trim more Thalias and play the rest in pieces and just like plan less on locking them on mana and more on just denying them resources that actually kill you. But Thalia is still really good. Like, e even on the draw, like, Thalia is really annoying and demands an answer. So I'll probably, you know, keep playing it. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Marin Crusader and Phyrexian Crusader were a part of the same set. Uh, we're going to keep this hand. It's a little soft the days, but we have like quadruple one drop and one land. That's fine. Um, I usually don't trim a Wisp because Wisp trades with Delver. And you want as many cards as you can that can trade with a Delver. Fuck. All right, that's pretty good. Opponent gets gets the two for one with their ball therapy getaxine probe combo. Really tempted to snap off a wasteland there and just like see how bad their hand is, but now that I lost my ether vials, I probably just need to keep my land. <clears throat> I need to adjust the text of the Womp Womp counter. It's not resetting in between instances. It's just a lifelong, lifelong Womp Womp counter. Hmm. I've been tempted, chat. I've been tempted by a double wasteland back-to-back -back draw. I don't know that I have the strength to resist. Like, if I Swords the Deathrite Shaman and wasteland them, followed by wasteland them again, that might be really strong. But there are currently no lands in the graveyard for Deathrite Shaman, so it's currently not actually producing mana. Awkwardly, the Deathrite Shaman represents getting one of the cards in my hand with Cabal Therapy. So if I just play Stoneforge and like fetch Batter Skull. My opponent probably has to trade their Deathrite Shaman for the Batter Skull. If my opponent doesn't have another creature, then on my next turn I play Stoneforge and I have a better chance of actually putting my uh, equipment in. I would not make this line if my opponent didn't have the Cabal Therapy in the graveyard, I don't think. A 
opponent probably has three underground seas. <coughs> if my opponent misses a land drop, I'll just wasteland them again. I have more lands than they do. They shuffle with Ponder. Still might wasteland them in all honesty. Especially if I draw another land. <sighs> uh, I think I need this one. We're gonna get Sword of Fire and Ice. You know, our plan for the next turn is put Batter Skull in. Plan for the following turn is put Sword of Fire and Ice in. That way, if my opponent just slams something stupid like a true name nemesis, we can get through. I I don't know. Like wasting when you have one land, they have two lands, they have cantrips in their deck is a bit of a losing proposition. Uh, if uh, if my opponent sticks a threat, like let's just say it's even something simple like a Delver, and I miss on lands for two to three turns, it's really rough. Pretty surprised my opponent did not sacrifice their Deathrite Shaman to get rid of one of the pieces of equipment that's in my hand. I think that means they might have something like an Abrade to get rid of my first piece of equipment. I'm just going to continue to choke them on mana here. Uh, since I already got rid of one underground C, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the second underground C. Grim Lava Mancer. You bet. I'm going to go ahead and play Sword of Fire and Ice, which is going to act as the Abyss. They can take my Batter Skull. So now they're going to have to like chomp with this death right shaman, then they're down to just volcanic island left.
not going to protect with Mom here to, like, just absolutely push through the Death Rite Shaman because my opponent could have Fatal Push. We'll just play around that. Oh, wow. Opponent does not block, which is a clear misplay. Because I just get an extra card this way. Alright, they just, they just scoop it up. They had, they had given up all, uh, all hope there. <laughs> what kind of madman sacks their, sacks their best creature? The, the madman who has lost all hope. Alright, so we're on the draw for that one and we win. So game two, play double waste opponent and win with equipment. Alright, easy as that. So the stability of my mana base and things like the extra Path to Exiles and like the Avengers and the Crusaders just really make the Delver matchup a breeze. You know, I have something like probably like a 75% win rate with Mono White against um, Grixis Delver. Which is crazy good considering that it's uh, like the, the quote-unquote best deck of the format. It's kind of unfortunate for my opponent there. The the Grim Lava Mancer, if it came earlier, could have done something. But the fact that I had active Mother of Runes meant that like even if it, it makes it around the table, they have to spend a turn shooting the mom, then another turn shooting the mom, and then and only then can they get around to like trying to deal with the Stone Forge and whatever piece of equipment I put in. So for anyone who doesn't know me, hello, my name is Phil Gallagher, I run Thraben University, and tonight we're streaming a relatively stock Mono White D and T list. You can see that here. Uh, this is a donor deck, so you can thank uh, William S. for his donation and the sponsorship of this stream. Uh, just to say this while we're waiting, I'm also working on making some changes to Thraben University, so things might look weird for a day or two while I... Uh, Figure some stuff out. How do we... Why do we always meet like this? <laughs> this is like the third time that I've gotten paired against uh, this player while they are watching my stream, sort of humorously enough. Uh, and we're currently 0-2 against them. Uh, they are playing uh, Maverick. <laughs> I will keep a somewhat weak hand. Uh, so you say Delver isn't ever beating D&T. That is very much not true. <laughs> um, opponent, I, I, I just quipped about how uh, my opponent keeps beating me, and they say, well, that's probably not going to happen now. Um, Delver's win rate against the red-white version of D&T is much closer to 50% than, uh, than the mono-white build. And the Delver decks have been doing some annoying things lately, like playing Culligan's Command and, uh, like, True Name Nemesis and Liliana the Last Hope and shit of that nature. Oh shit! <laughs> oh, it's a mom start. I'm not prepared for that. Swords off the top one time, dealer. Uh oh. Uh, I'm just gonna port my opponent to slow him down. Uh, I can just jam. Uh, I could just jam Stoneforge here, but I can still go for like the turn. For Stoneforge equip attack, if I just do it completely off of Vile, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, 
Oh yeah, it. There was a time when Delver almost never beat D and T. Um, like at. S oh man, opponent has no second land. Uh oh. Uh oh. Now we have a mom too. So I can port them again. Put in Revoker, name something. Then on my next turn, play Stoneforge, get Jitte, cast Jitte, equip Jitte. Seems devastating. Indeed, this is an oops we win situation. Swords to Plowshares, my mom. I will protect my mom. Land, sure. Okay. Yeah, they they still have one land. I get to end of turn put in Jitte. They they just concede to that. All right. So, you know, our our cards didn't really win the match. Their cards lost the match. Um, so I have played my opponent twice this week, and both times they were on Maverick. But this opening of Planes into Mom, Swords to Plowshares, and Wasteland could just also be indicative of D&T, and my opponent is a friend of the channel, so we do have to respect the possibility that they are just on D&T and not Maverick. So either way, I want Sword of War in peace. Either way, I want Council's Judgment. Some number of paths are reasonable for either deck. Rest in peace is only reasonable for Maverick. So, let's pull like let's let's do what's good for both matchups, and that's pull the Thalias and the Sanctum Prelates. This probably means that I should not board in Rest in Peace and board in two Path to Exiles. <laughs> H HC Fox Predator into their Skyship. Are we talking about like the like? The, that, like, five-mana artifact that, like, lightning bolts a creature or player when it comes in and you can crew it? Because that card's sweet. <sighs> yeah, I think this is how I board. And then if they're Maverick, I'll probably sub in the Rest in Peace for the two Path to Exile.
I don't believe I actually scummed that Delver player with my next level play. That's the shit that works on paper, it shouldn't work on Magic Online. Oh, the art on Cataclysm, I see. <coughs> alright, looks like... Yeah, alright, so it was DNT. We have a, a very good opener against DNT. We get to go Mom into Revoker on their Vile. <laughs> My opponent gave me the big ol' smiley face in chat. Had the swords. Our hand is now much weaker. But hopefully they don't have a mom and we get a huge tempo boost here. Ooh, don't don't have the mom. Opponent is surely on mono white vile maverick. Don't be fooled, Phil. <laughs> well, not much I can do about that now, is there? Ah, yes. The classic, play my own ether vial after revoking ether vial line. <laughs> Mono white waifu tribal. Mostly. I don't know that revoker is a good waifu. Deal. Oh wow, opponent did not have a two drop to put in off of their vial after pathing. Uh, I hope they just don't like slam a fucking Gideon or something like that here. That'd be super unfortunate. Ooh. Ooh, opponent's hands. Presumably kinda weak here. All right, what do you got for me? A flicker wisp. What would you like to do with your flicker wisp? What is that targeting? Oh, it's just targeting my ether vial for tempo reasons. Sure. Um, do I want to just wasteland their Rashadon port to give myself access to white white on the next turn and the possibility of playing another guy? Yeah, probably. I'm also going to source to Plowshares this in case they have another Flicker Wisp. Thalia waiting room? <laughs> She's the only reason you play the deck. <laughs> yeah, Thalia's great. Thalia 2.0, less great, but still pretty good sometimes.
opponent getting used to which vial is which uh, with like how the triggers get stacked. All right, opponent opponent draws another port. That is not what they want to draw, but you know it keeps me off some stuff. All right, sure. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick think about their flicker, like if they have a flicker wisp here. If I move the relic order now, my thing comes back, then they flicker wisp it, and I lose my vial if I do it at the end step, and I hit Relic Order there, and they Flicker Wisp it out, I get my vial back, it ticks up to one, at the end step they get rid of it, so like it's gone either way. So... I'll just do it at the end step, I guess. No, I guess if I draw Mother of Runes, then this way it lets me cast the Mother of Runes. Or, excuse me, Violin the Mother of Runes. Also note, you don't want to remove Relic Order with a trigger on the stack, or you're going to have a bad time. Just gonna do a quick containment priest check. Oh man, opponent forgot to port us. <laughs> opponent immediately says, oh shit. Oh shit indeed. Uh, I think I'm just going to use this opportunity to uh, put a Jitte in play. And then I have a really sweet follow up play on the next turn. Oh, actually, I could just get sort. Oh, yeah. All right. So to use my mana efficiently, I'm just going to cast Jete now. And then if my opponent ports me, I can float a mana, put in a new Stone Forge, and get sort of War and Peace on my next turn. Or just tick the vial up to three and just start going to town with Flicker Wisps. Ha <laughs> ha. 
That's the first time I've heard it referred to as Thick Thalia. That's cute. Alright. Opponent, opponent flooding here. Alright. So I'm going to activate Stoneforge Mystic, hold priority, Aether Vial, put in Stoneforge Mystic, get Sword of War and Peace, put Sword of War and Peace into play here. That seems great. Uh, why no caverns in this list? I want stability of mana base. <laughs> I like the troll response of, obviously because they don't make snow mana. Alright, opponent is putting in a 3-drop. It is a recruiter. It probably gets a revoker. Oh, there's the Revoker. If my opponent names... Aether Vial with this Revoker, then I'm not in great shape. So what I can do here is I guess put in a Flicker Wisp just so, so that I have a flyer just in case. And then I can connect with equipment on my next turn. Yeah, so I can, I can Flicker Wisp, target a Stone Forge, get a new piece of equipment, equip my Flicker Wisp with Sword of War and Peace, and then be in great shape. The, like, Blood Moon and Price of Progress is a, a real cost to running flagstones.
Oh, this is just the triggered ability from Ether Vial still. All right, Swords the Plowshares is an acceptable draw. We may combine that with other things a little bit later to do nasty things. Although I think I'm just going to hold up my mana here because I can go and put in Batter Skull uh, with my Stoneforge. Or have Swords the Plowshares open if my opponent tries to get overly aggressive. Right, but if you play Flagstones, you want to play a set. It, it functions best as a set. That way, like, you can somewhat consistently get value with your, uh, like, Cataclysms and such when you're blowing up your own lands. Wow, opponent just, like, really ripping lands. Like, I know I gave one of them with Path, but that's, that's their seventh land this game. I'm going to give my opponent a second to get back in the chat so I can tell them a few things. Alright, so we're on the draw there, and we win. So game two, opponent floods and loses to triple equipment. Yeah, uh, you flooded out super hard that game, man. <laughs> super hard. There was, wasn't a lot you could do. Um, you did a good job of trying to keep me off balance um, by, like, repeatedly removing and flickering and relic ordering my, my vial. But, like, when you have seven lands and two ether vials, like, you just don't have a lot of action. You, you basically did the best with the resources that you had. Uh, not, not a ton you could have done there. <laughs> yeah, there were there there were definitely some some micro plays and some timing differences uh, that that were costly. Um, uh, mi missing the port activation and letting me get that Jitse in play was really really rough. Um, and there also. I, I didn't do the math for it, but I think there was a recruiter line where where since you had that recruiter, you go cast recruiter, get flicker wisp, flicker wisp, blink recruiter, end step, recruiter for revoker, tap, put in revoker, and you end up like with a bonus flicker wisp. Uh, I, I think that was something that could have happened on your turn since you had a bunch of lands. Uh, don't remember whether or not you could have ported to in addition to all of that. Yeah. I think my opponent plays Sneak and Show. Alright, maybe I lied. I feel like I've played against this player before. Alright. Burn. Bring it on. We're playing Burn on the draw. Thalia on top. Deal. Yeah, and like that's the thing. When you go and switch decks a lot, you're not you don't have the mental reps and the mental shortcuts for like 
how your mana works and all of that stuff. And, and so you miss things in the moment, especially if you're trying to play quickly. Ooh, bonus planes. Deal, deal, deal. Oh, an opponent misses a land drop. And we have Athalia. Mmm. Mmm, so tasty. So tasty, chat. Mmm. So delicious. <laughs> the tears of my opponent. Mmm. Alright, they found a land. They get to continue to play magic by lightning bolting my Thalia. <coughs> Phil the Bully is back. Moxall, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Full the Billy. Phil the Billy. Ah. Scoop! TLDR, Bully never left. Bully's been here the whole time. Phil Billy. Ugh. I want to take like six mulligans on that punchline. It was rough. Definitely misplayed on the punchline. Alright, Goblin God, you want to give us a land there, buddy? Oh, you do want to give us a land. Thank you. We'll give you two life. Their Goblin Guide did a lot of work. It did six points of damage and got a card out of me. But although it did give me a couple of lands. Alright, Sulfuric Vortex, you say. I actually don't care that much. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. so bad. <laughs> Alright. We have uh, now put my opponent on very few outs to kill us. On my next turn, I flicker without the Sulfuric Vortex and gain 8 life. And then we're done. Opponent would need to have, like, back to basics, or excuse me, uh, Price of Progress, Price of Progress, Fire Blast to take us out of this game. Alright, 
this price. There's a flame rift. Alright, we go to two. Use Aether Vile's ability, always no to that. No. I'm gonna play around Fire Blast, even though I should just be dead if my opponent has it. I'm gonna play around Fire Blast by, like, main phase, blank Sulfuric Vortex. And I think I'm gonna do that while leaving Wasteland up so that I can wasteland myself off my Caracas. I'll gain two life. I'll gain two life. I'll gain two life. I'm gonna gain two life. I'm gonna wasteland myself now. We're gonna take absolutely no chances. Everything that I have on board is more than enough to win this game. Opponent is now facing lethal on board, you know, completely ignoring the Jitte and the second Sulfuric Vortex here. Goblin Guide. Yes. Alright, what do you what do you have for me here, opponent? I have a port on top. I'm fine with blocking. Second sulfuric vortex. Alright. And then they concede. Alright, so for anyone who has ever asked themselves, why is Flicker Wisp a good magic card? It's reasons like that. Alright, game one result win. So game one win with Jitte and Prelate using Wisp to beat Sulfuric Vortex. Awesome. We'll be on the draw for game two. So against Burn, we play more removal. We play some things that get rid of uh, Sulfuric Vortex. We play some things that slow my opponent down. And we gain some life gain. Crusader's kind of slow here. Sword of Fire and Ice doesn't actually gain me any life. Unless my opponent has Grim Lava Mancer, Revoker doesn't actually do anything here. And then I need to make two trims. I suppose I'm just fine with trimming Revokers, or Recruiters. Who asked that question? It's Flicker, it's Flicker Wisp. Oh, is Flicker Wisp good? Oh, yes, Flicker Wisp, you're good. Good job, Flicker Wisp. And, uh, sort of Fire and Ice is good in this matchup, but we have three pieces of equipment that gain life. Might as well play those over it, and we don't want to, like, draw two pieces of equipment in most games. 
All right, opponent does not have the optimal start of beginning with Goblin Guide this time. So, things are looking good. Opponent was also f 6 there. I thought they were anyway. Okay. Opponent kept this seven card hand. Opponent kept this seven card hand. All right, Flame Rift, deal. Tax them out. Yeah, so opponent will use their turn to get rid of this Thalia. We'll then play a Thalia with protection up, then put in Stone Forge and get an equipment end of turn, and that's probably that. Oh yeah, like, we, we might get, you know, pounded by, like, Searing Blaze or Searing Blood or something like that. Or my opponent might just, like, concede the game right here. You know. Either way. I'm fine. Oh wow, no... No play here. So we get the super punishing line of, like, play Caracas, and now they can't remove Thalia with a one-mana removal spell. <coughs> if I have to main phase one of these, I want it to be Canonist. Opponent spends a bolt to get rid of a canonist. Deal. How can you keep a, can a hand that can't remove Thalia? I don't know. A, a hand that doesn't have a one-drop accelerate, like a one-drop creature, or no one-drop removal spell to get rid of a Thalia seems really loose. Or opponent just played badly. Maybe opponent is not uh, sure how Thalia works. They need to pay one more mana. Okay, so opponent just played badly and did not play around Caracas because they're not familiar with the deck. Okay. Yep, so opponent should have removed Thalia on, on their turn, and they just did not, and got super, super punished. So now they, like, they might... The, the sort of un, 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 uh, the unfortunate side effect of them playing badly is if they have another one-drop removal spell, um... This is a very bad attack from my opponent, but I'm not going to try to punish them for it because uh, I'm probably just taking over the game. Alright, opponent, you're gonna need to show me a Fire Blast right here. Do you have a Fire Blast? If so, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh. Oh god, Sword of War and Peace. You're so good. You're so good, Sword of War and Peace. So I hit my opponent for four. They then take five additional damage. I gain three life. 
So the Sword of War and Peace trigger was an 8-point life swing. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Everyone in chat should understand how much I like Sword of War and Peace. It's... This card is really good. Yep, opponent scoops it up. Unbeatable, that Sword of War and Peace. So game two, opponent punts by not removing Thalia, and I punish with Sword of War and Peace equip. Alright, and just like that we're 4-0. Ooh, you hit an ant player with Thalia and War and Peace a couple of weeks back. Yeah, that feels really good. Because, like, every two points of life you gain in the ant matchup is, like, two more, or excuse me, is one more storm count they need in order to kill you. So, like, if you have a hand that has something super stupid like six cards, like, that's three more storm that needs to kill you, and you, you nug them for a few, you know, oftentimes five or six damage, making it harder to win with, like, an ad nauseum. It, it, it's disgusting. Playing against Aplin. Don't recognize the name. I don't think I've played against them before. Or maybe it's a plan. No real data on my opponent. The last time they uh, they got a trophy was in like 2016 with Shardless Bug. Uh, so we'll just keep what is a reasonable but slightly clunky hand. <coughs> I'm going to play the Aether Vial out this turn. I'm almost certain to just Wasteland them the next turn. I'll not pay for days. Can't do that. Pretty happy to be playing against Delver with this list again. Our opponent took a line that was uh, insulated from Wasteland. So we'll just jam a Stoneforge. How do you like that, opponent? Because I'm going to go ahead and get a Batter Skull. Ooh, you're going to stifle my trigger? You're going to be a, be a bully and stifle my trigger? Oh. Okay. Well... They're not going to be a bully and stifle my trigger. They're going to be a bully and fatal push my Stoneforge. But they really should have waited until after I fetched my equipment in order to show me that they were... going to fatal push my Stoneforge. And by fatal push, I mean dismember. <coughs> Alright, opponent, you get to see what's going on. I'm gonna wasteland the crap out of you. Unless you play a Deathrite Shaman, then I might not. Yeah, uh, Dismember is unusual. Ooh, Garbag Angler? Alright, you got the Dangler. Alright. So I have to think about how I want to approach this game now. My opponent has me dead in 5 hits with this Gurmag Angler, so my goal is to stabilize with Batter Skull, but my opponent is going to wasteland me off of whatever land that I play this turn. So in terms of mana efficiency, I should plan on Flicker Wisping this turn, getting wastelanded, playing Sword of Fire and Ice the next turn, trying to equip, 
and then hopefully hitting another land so that I can play Batter Skull. Um, in the face of a clock that's faster than my own clock, I don't want to go and just wasteland their, their underground sea and try to race them. Uh, that won't work out well for me. Port is my least valuable land, so I'm going to play that one. That's actually a fine draw. Alright. Another wasteland's pretty crippling. <sighs> Alright, opponent has it all over there. I'll be chump blocking with Phyrexian Revoker on my next turn, if my opponent doesn't but just like have a removal spell. I'm gonna tap that to play around discard. God damn it. <sighs> Alright, sometimes you get Delvered. Hand was awesome. Uh, opponent had, like, the exact sequence of things to mess up what I was doing. You know, they had... They, they answered the Vile, they answered the Stoneforge, they answered my land, they answered my mom, they answered my creature, they answered my equipment, they answered my next creature. Mind you, they did this without a single goddamn cantrip all game. So they, they had the perfects there. That was unbeatable. Alright. Paths in. Council's Judgment in. Revokers out. Prelate out. And Athalia out. This hand is amazing. We lead with a vial, that resolves, we wasteland them and swords them to death. <coughs> we'll draw a way to win eventually. I'm not worried about that.
I 100% think it would have been worse to play Wasteland. Absolutely worse. Uh, if we Wasteland our opponent, our chances of resolving the Batter Skull at any point in the game go down like probably like 60%. And the way we win that game is by like sticking the Batter Skull and stabilizing to beat the Gurmag. If we Wasteland in the face of the Gurmag, that's a better clock than what we have. I'm very, very, very much in trouble. If I tag his wasteland, I still lose a land, right? So, like, the net cost is the same. I'm trying to decide how I want to play this turn. I can just, like, I don't want to Wasteland my opponent until I know that the Swords to Plowshares is going to resolve. If my opponent forces to protect the Deathrite Shaman, then I want to have um, Swords to Plowshares available. And if they have the Force, I don't want to Wasteland, I want to Swords to Plowshares again. So this is super awkward. Uh, but doing that doesn't play around days, which my opponent very much might have in the deck. And I know you say they won't have it on the draw, but I'm proven wrong a lot. I'm gonna play out the Wasteland. And my opponent doesn't have the Force, so overthought it. Uh, last time I played against Bob Huang, he kept Dazes in on the draw, and he knows what the fuck he's doing, so... Keep that in mind. I'm gonna give my opponent a Rashad and Port to blow up, otherwise I'm gonna tap down their Wasteland. I'm just going to leave this at 2 until... Oh, opponent does not have another land. Well, we can't start killing them yet, but... They might be discarding. And they discard again. Ooh, they discard an Ancient Grudge. That's value. Uh, keeping in mind that they discarded Grudge, I'm gonna go ahead and tick Bile up to three. That way if I draw a Flicker Wisp, I can uh, do cute things. Uh. 
All right, opponent, we can play this game for as long as you want. All right, they scoop it up. I've got a donation for a zero permanent win game. Woo! We didn't even have to destroy that many of my opponent's permanents, right? Like, all we destroyed was Underground Sea and Wasteland. And they destroyed the Wasteland themselves. This is an example of kind of a weak hand that is not bad enough to go back. This has a mom as early interaction, which is probably enough. But, you know, it's a slow hand. Because we have this such a slow hand, I'm going to go and wasteland my opponent in their upkeep to play around stifle. Uh, because if I set my opponent back a turn... And, like, it sets us both back a turn. That favors me, because that means that, like, on effectively the, th like, the third turn of the, day the game, Sarah Avenger can just come down. I expect this mom to die somehow. Looks like lightning bolt. Alright, opponent probably digging for another mana source here, if I were to guess. Yes, this is the, the two Mirror and Crusader, two Sarah deck, uh, with two planes over two Cavern of Souls for stability. Opponent shuffles, and they play a Wasteland. I'll play around your Wasteland. Uh, this is only turn three, so we can't do the Avenger yet. So I'll just hold Swords to Plowshares up for their threat. Then next turn, I'll bait the Wasteland with Caracas number one. You can see what's going on. My hand's pretty sweet. You have a death rich, Simon. I'm gonna try to remove your death rich, Simon. You presumably know that, and it's just gonna die. Yep. I'm going to play around a daze here by playing a Sarah Avenger rather than a Flicker Wisp. I might be able to get some degree of value from the Flicker Wisp a little bit later down the line, even if it's something simple, just like unflipping a Delver. Yep.
You have a Delver. Alright, opponent has a ponder. Diabolic Edict. Yes, I'll sacrifice my Flicker Wisp, that's fine. That's a fine draw. Alright, so this is where we want to be against Delver. Um, we have an answer to their last creature, and we'll be in essentially a top deck war against each other, and our top decks are way better than their top decks. Now we get to play around Spell Pierce too? Sweet. I'm most afraid of, like, Gurmag Angler, so I guess I'll tap that, but opponent is likely to just fetch whatever mana source they need, so it's of minimal impact. Alright, would love to rip removal this turn. That only is a fine draw. Um, in order for them to Lily, they would need, like, two additional lands. So, if if my opponent goes and attacks with that Pyromancer, I have the the opportunity to like bounce Thalia and Violet back in. Mm, do I want to trade Avenger, or do I just like want to get aggressive back? So my opponent puts me to 11, I'll be attacking for 5 a turn, but effectively not really 5 a turn. I think I'm okay with taking this hit. Uh. 
I want to give myself, like, the option of putting an equipment on Sarah Vendor if I draw it. And we'll be leaving this vial at 2 until we have a reason to tick it up. All right, opponent does no attacks here. That means that they've they've come to respect the Sarah Avenger and probably want to trade for it. I will offer that trade. I haven't given them main phase red for a few turns. I'm going to continue to not do so. I feel like getting this trop is a shuffle rather than like some bait to get me to try to tap the trop. Uh, we are in our last round of a Mono White Sarah Avenger Mirren Crusader stream. Alright, they have floated a red this time. A braid targeting ether vial. I have bad news for you, opponent. We're gonna get Sword of Fire and Ice to push through the tokens and guarantee lethal. Not block. Thank you. All right, and folks, that's a five zero.
So game three, that was a win with really Thalia, Caracas, and Vile holding the ground. Uh, so let, let's go ahead and just uh, recap tonight. So tonight was wins against Turbo Depths, Grixis Delver, D&T, Burn, and Grixis Delver. Um, the mono white builds have been feeling really good. Um, I'm on a hot streak. I've gotten three, four ones in a row, followed by tonight's 5-0 with various mono white builds of different natures. Um, so I think I played the Crusader build and got a 4-1, the Judge's Familiar build got a 4-1, Selfless Spirit got a 4-1, and this got a 5-0. So yeah, you didn't ruin it this time. We beat you, so that's why we 5-0'd. As you flood out terribly. Um, but, but yeah, um, the, the Mono White builds have, have felt pretty good. And just talking about why that is right now, uh, Grixis Delver is increasingly becoming a larger and larger portion of the metagame. So with, with this exact list and most of the ones that I've been playing, we've been gearing towards beating Grixis Delver harder with the Mono White lists than normal by, like, playing the extra p the path and, like, a couple of extra planes over other flex slot lands like Cavern of Souls. And because of that, um, we just have stronger stability. And I also think that my sideboard changes I made against Delver of not playing Rest in Peace and instead playing Recruiter of the Guard also helped my win percentages uh, tick up there a little bit. Uh, so I've been very, very happy. Did, did I get a 3-2 in the Judges Familiar stream? Hold on, let me look. I, I thought it was a 4-1. So it was win versus Grixis Delver, lost to Punishing Deck. Oh, lost to Maverick. Okay, sorry, that was a 3-2. But well, my other recent streams have been 4-1s. Yeah, so 4-1 with Selfless Spirit. Uh, looks like 4-1 with, I think, the Crusader build. Uh, it's It's been a, a good, good stream. How do I feel about a Horizon Canopy over the 12th planes? I'm not a huge fan of Horizon Canopy, generally speaking. When you draw it in your opener and you have to use it on, like, your mana sinks, like Rashad and Port and Stoneforge Mystic, it feels really bad. Um, so I'm not a huge fan. So thank you, um, everyone for tuning in tonight and for all of the various support that you've given me. You know, many of you have, like, subbed and resubbed or, or donated and helped support this channel in other ways. Um, I'm going to give my page a quick refresh here. I want to see what my current follower count is up to. Hey, that is uh, exactly 500 followers as of tonight. So that means that I owe you all a Tin Fins stream at some point in the not-too-distant future. I'll, I'll have to go and talk to my roommate about when I can borrow his, uh, his Magic Online deck, but... Expect that sometime in the uh, the not too distant future. I'm very excited about that. Tin fins is, is super fun, and I, I hope you'll all enjoy that as a reward for uh, you know this this stream growing. It's it's come a long way in in two months here. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick check through, see who's playing some legacy that I can co can host. Five oh five hundred followers. Math checks out. It, it just makes sense, right? All right. Uh, so thank you everyone for fo for for following and and subscribing and doing everything you do to to let me you know enjoy playing Legacy as much as I am. The support I, I get from you all really really means a lot. Uh, and you know, Will, thank you very much for for donating to to make this stream happen. I'm gonna go ahead and call it a night. I'll uh, see you all next Monday, if not sooner. Take care.